thinking for someone else to bring you to peace on the hill, and now it's himself, fumbled in the dark for the phone, and hate cut the thundering voice summoning him and his comrades to the military weapons. Small. Trotsky barely had time to savor his success in helping to win control of the Peter and Paul fortress when the first disjointed reports of Kerensky's call for loyal troops from outside the capital and rumors of the government's crackdown on the extreme left began to trickle into Smolny. Soon, military revolutionary committee contacts in the suburbs began phoning in word of alarming activity among troop units in their localities. And workers from the Trud printing press arrived with news of the raid on Rabachi Put. Between phone calls to the dwellings and offices of party officials, military revolutionary committee leaders already at Smolny, Trotsky, Lazimir, Sverdlov, Antonov, Podvoisky, and Lashevich among them, drew up and dispatched an alert to regimental committees and commissars and military units and installations throughout the Petrograd area. Titled Directive Number 1, this order read, The Petrograd Soviet is in direct danger. Counter-revolutionary conspirators have attempted to bring cadets and shock battalions from the suburbs to Petrograd during the night. The newspapers sold that and Rabachi put have been closed. You are hereby directed to bring your regiment to battle readiness and to await further instructions. Any procrastination or interference in executing this order will be considered a betrayal of the revolution. To bring insurgent forces to battle readiness was one thing. To decide what direct military action, if any, to take in response to the apparent government attack was quite another. Only a few hours earlier, the Military Revolutionary Committee had backed away from the brink of a military clash with the government, still justifiably fearful of seriously weakening its base of support. By the morning of October 24th, enough delegates to the Congress of Soviets had arrived in the capital to indicate that, with the left SRs, a solid majority could be counted on to support the transfer of power to the Soviets and the creation by the Congress of an exclusively socialist government. Kerensky's crackdown on the left, however, injected a major new element into the situation. If Kerensky were not rebuffed, if he succeeded in mobilizing a large loyalist military force and putting leftist leaders back behind bars, it was still possible that the Congress of Soviets would not meet at all. Even if the Congress were not dispersed, the Military Revolutionary Committee's careful and, up to now, apparently successful effort to set the stage for the overthrow of the government, either immediately before or just after the opening of the Congress, would be seriously undermined. With such considerations in mind, some members of the Military Revolutionary Committee now spoke up for starting an armed uprising without further delay. However, a majority, led by Trotsky, insisted on a firm yet more restrained response. Trotsky quickly scratched out an order to soldier committees in two of the best organized, most revolutionary units in the garrison, the Litovsky Regiment and the 6th Engineer Battalion, directing them to take charge of reopening the Tread Press and ensuring its security. The Soviet of Workers and Soldiers deputies cannot tolerate suppression of the free word, the order asserted. For the people fighting off the attack of the pogromists, there must be assurance of an honest press. This directive was implemented at once. A company of Litovsky guards armed with machine guns and led by Dashkovich arrived at the building house or the building housing the Tread Press at 9 a.m. Dashkovich, ignoring the Military Revolutionary Committee's announcement of the previous night, declared bluntly that orders of the government not countersigned by the Military Revolutionary Committee are invalid. His troops overwhelmed loyalist militiamen and smashed government seals. 
Within a couple of hours, Rubbishy Put was back in production. A reporter for Berzivy Vidomosti describing these developments in the October 24th evening edition observed that the comrade soldiers made no similar effort to liberate Ziv Zivoslovo, which also had been shut down. Meanwhile, at Smolny, Sverdlov had managed to convene a meeting of the party central committee. Present were Lomov, Zerzinski, Sverdlov, Bubnov, Nogin, Militin, Yoffi, Yuritsky, Trotsky, and Berzin, as well as Kamenev, whose earlier resignation from the committee seems to have been simply ignored. In view of the developing crisis and the difficulty of rounding up Central Committee members in a hurry, it was agreed at the outset that for the rest of the day, no members would leave Smolny without specific authorization. The first substantive issue that the committee discussed, interestingly enough, was not the government's attack on the left, but the progress of negotiations between the Military Revolutionary Committee and General Polkovnikov on the nature of the Petrograd Soviet's influence over military operations. Initially, committee members seemed to have had the mistaken impression that the government's actions had been undertaken before the Military Revolutionary Committee's acceptance of the terms proposed by the Petrograd Military District. Only after Kamenev had reported on the earlier agreement did the Central Committee turn to the trouble at Trun, ultimately endorsing the dispatch of a guard to protect the press, as well as the adoption of whatever, whatever other steps were necessary to ensure the publication of the next regular issues of the party's papers. Apart from this, the Central Committee members seem to have been most concerned with the possibility that postal and telegraph workers, and also railway men, among whom moderate socialist influence was still strong, might oppose the overthrow of the provisional government and respond to the transfer of power to the Soviets by attempting to isolate the capital from the rest of the country. As political developments relating to the Congress of Soviets appeared to be reaching a climax, and the creation of a revolutionary regime seemed imminent. They also worried about matters such as food supply and the maintenance of a close working relationship with the left SRs. Thus, Bubnov was made responsible for establishing contact with rail workers, and Zerzinski was with postal and telegraph employees. At the same time, Militin was charged with organizing food supplies and Kamenev and Berzin were designated to conduct negotiations with the left SRs. At Trotsky's insistence, the Central Committee, before adjourning, agreed on one further precaution. A reserve headquarters was to be established in the newly won Peter and Paul Fortress for use if Smolny should fall to the Loyalists. Actually, the historical importance of the Central Committee meeting of October 24th derives as much from what was not discussed there as from the issues that were in fact raised. On the morning of October 24th, it had been noted some, it had been noted, some military revolutionary committee members advocated an immediate call for a mass rising. At roughly the same hour, the Bolshevik Petersburg Committee assembled for the first time since October 15th, responded to the latest developments by formally calling for the preparation of an insurrection without any delay whatever. Within the Central Committee, however, no doubt in part because of Lenin's absence, the crucial question of whether or not to attempt to do away with the provisional government at once, or at any rate before the Congress of Soviets, was apparently given no serious consideration. Rather, it appears that, at this point, most Central Committee members were absorbed with the task of neutralizing the actions of the enemy and retaining or consolidating the strength of the left, so as to maximize the possibility of utilizing the Congress of Soviets to settle scores. Finally, with the government. Significant in this regard is a comment on the Central Committee's outlook made by Stalin on the afternoon of October 24th at a caucus of Bolshevik Congress delegates. Within the Military Revolutionary Committee, he said, there are two points of view. The first is that we organize an uprising at once, and the second is that we first consolidate our forces. 
the Central Committee has sided with the second view. The continuing emphasis of the Bolshevik Central Committee and the Military Revolutionary Committee on the role of the Congress of Soviets in completing the task of subverting the provisional government and creating a revolutionary Soviet regime was nowhere more clearly reflected than in the lead editorial prepared by Stalin for the edition of Rabachi Put that reached the streets sometime after midday on October 24th, capped by the headline, What We Need. The editorial called upon workers and soldiers to form delega delegations for the purpose, oh fuck, for the purpose of applying direct pressure on the Congress of Soviets to replace the Kerensky government with a revolutionary re regime, wrote Stalin. The present imposter government, which was not elected by the people and which is not accountable to the people, must be replaced by a government recognized by the people, elected by the representatives of the workers, soldiers, and peasants, and accountable to these representatives. Do you want the present government of landlords and capitalists to be replaced by a new government, a government of workers and peasants? Do you want the new government of Russia to proclaim the abolition of landlordism and to transfer all the landed estates to peasant committees without compensation? Do you want the new government of Russia to publish the Tsar's secret treaties, to declare them invalid, and to propose a just peace to all belligerent nations? Do you want the new government of Russia to put a thorough curb on organizers of lockouts and profiteers who are deliberately fomenting famine and unemployment, economic disruption, and high prices? If you want this, muster all your forces, rise as one man, organize meetings and elect your delegations, and through them, lay your demands before the Congress of Soviets, which opens tomorrow at Smolny. The tactical caution displayed by the National Bolshevik leadership was also reflected on October 24th in the Kronstadt Bolshevik paper, Prolet Proletarsko Delo, and in the new Bolshevik-controlled evening newspaper of the Petrograd Soviet, Robochi i Soldat. Dominating the front page of Robochi i Soldat, on the evening of October 24th was the banner headline, The All-Russian Congress Will Begin on October 25th. This was followed by a full-page full proclamation from the Military Revolutionary Committee to the, pop to the population of Petrograd. Citizens, the counter-revolution has raised its treacherous head. The Kornilovites are mobilizing their forces to suppress the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, and to break up the Constituent Assembly. At the same time, pogromists may try to instigate disorder and massacres on the streets of Petrograd. The Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies takes upon itself responsibility for the protection of revolutionary order from the counter-revolution and pogromist attacks. The garrison of Petrograd will not permit any violence or disturbance. Citizens, we call upon you to maintain calm and self-control. The cause of order and of the revolution is in firm hands. Signed, the Military Revolutionary Committee. This continuing orientation toward the Congress of Soviets was voiced in public pronouncements as well as in the press. In a speech to the afternoon caucus of the Bolshevik Congress fraction, at which Stalin had drawn attention to the Central Committee's tactical stance, Trotsky seemed anxious, above all, to dispel whatever fears the Bolshevik leaders assembled from all over Russia might have that the revolution was in imminent danger, or that the actions of Military Revolutionary Committee in any way usurped the functions of the Congress. He declared, The government is powerless. We are not afraid of it because we have sufficient strength. Some of the comrades, for example, Kemenev and Ryazanov, do not agree with our assessment of the situation. However, we are leaning neither to the right nor to the left. Our tactical line has been determined by developing circumstances. We grow stronger every day. Our task is to defend ourselves and gradually to expand our sphere of authority so as to build a solid foundation for tomorrow's Congress of Soviets. The views of the entire country will be revealed tomorrow and Petrograd will not be alone in responding to its summons.
according to a letter written the following day by Mikhail Zakov, a participant in this caucus, Trotsky, toward the end of his address, took pains to insist that the arrest of the provisional government was not planned as an independent task. If the Congress creates a government and Kerensky does not obey it, this would be a police and not a political problem. Trotsky is recorded as declaring, It would be a mistake to use even one of the armored cars, which now defend the Winter Palace, to arrest the government. However, the Military Revolutionary Committee's decision to reopen the printing house of Rabachi Put and to entrust the valiant Litovsky Regiment instead of cadets to guard it was no mistake. This is defense, comrades, this is defense. Zakov noted that at this point Trotsky was interrupted by a storm of wild applause. At a session of the Petrograd Soviet a few years or a few hours later, Trotsky spoke out in a similar vein, insisting that an armed conflict today or tomorrow on the eve of the All-Russian Congress is not in our plans. We are confident that the Congress will fulfill our slogan with great force and authority, he continued. But if the government wants to make use of the 24, 48, or 72 hours, which it still has and comes out against us, then we will respond with a counterattack, matching blow for blow, steel for iron. Moreover, at close to this same hour, upon the insistence of the left SRs, the Military Revolutionary Committee issued a press release in which it categorically denied that an uprising was in preparation. Contrary to all kinds of rumors and reports, the Military Revolutionary Co uh, Committee declares that it exists not to prepare and carry out the seizure of power, but exclusively for defense of the interests of the Petrograd garrison and the democracy from counter-revolutionary encroachments. While the Bolsheviks were working to consolidate support for their program in the Congress of Soviets and making preparations for the creation of a revolutionary government by the Congress, Kerensky was feverishly attempting to implement his plans to curb the left and, equally important, to strengthen his defenses. He spent much of the morning of October 24th in the General Staff Building trying to speed up the dispatch to the capital of loyal troops from the front. Orders were now issued for the immediate removal of all Military Revolutionary Committee Commissars, and all troops of the garrison were strictly forbidden to leave their barracks without the without the specific authorization of Petrograd Military District, District Headquarters. During the morning and early afternoon, it became evident that the vast majority of troops were responding to directives from the extreme left, not to those from the regular military command. The alacrity with which soldiers from the Litovsky Regiment fulfilled Trotsky's order to assist in reopening the Tread printing press has already been mentioned. The behavior of the more than 500-man crew of the cruiser Aurora, which was just completing a year of capital repairs at the Franco-Russian shipyard, was also typical. Recognizing that the Aurora's radicalized crew would support the Military Revolutionary Committee, the regular naval command ordered the ship out to sea for engine tests. At the instigation of the Military Revolutionary Committee, however, Central Bolt counter, countermanded this order, and in response, the sailors rose against their officers and remained in Petrograd. As the hours wore on, it also became apparent to defenders of the government that, at best, the arrival of significant military help from outside Petrograd would be seriously delayed. Some of the military units called out on the night of October 23rd to 24th and the following day immediately declared their unwillingness to come to the government's aid, while others were prevented from doing so by local forces supporting the Military Revolutionary Committee. Then too, as the time of the Kornilov affair, the movement of troops from the front was interrupted well outside the capital, most front soldiers readily pledging support to the Military Revolutionary Committee as soon as the struggle between the government and the Petrograd Soviet was explained to them. About noon, the Women's Shock Battalion from Levashova, less than 200 strong, reported for duty at the Winter Palace. 
They were joined at 2 p.m. by a detachment of 68 cadets from the Mikulovsky Artillery School. Also, either already at the palace or reporting there during the day and night of October 24th, were 134 officers and roughly 2,000 cadets from officer training schools in Peterov, Oranenbaum, and Gechina. For the time being, this relatively meager force, a small fraction of what the Military Revolutionary Committee could draw on, was the best Kerensky could muster. Utilizing some of these forces, Kerensky did his best to strengthen security around government offices, rail stations, the Neva Bridges, and the vital public service institutions. In the early afternoon, the Prime Minister was driven to the Marinsky Palace, where he sought to rally the pre-parliament in support of the government and to obtain its endorsement for the measures already initiated to suppress the left. Kransky's rambling, emotion-charged speech on this occasion was to be his last public address in Russia. Frequently interrupted by storms of applause from the right and boos and hoots from the left, the speech, recently characterized by one historian as the hysterical wail of a bankrupt politician, lasted well over an hour. Kerensky began by accusing both the extreme right and the radical left of working to subvert the convocation of a constituent assembly and the creation of a free democratic system of government. The brunt of his criticism was reserved for the Bolsheviks. To buttress his condemnation of the party, Kerensky quoted extensively from the arguments for an immediate insurrection contained in Lenin's letter to comrades serialized in Rabachi put between October 19th and 21st. He also catalogued what he termed repeated Bolshevik appeals for, for an armed uprising, voiced at public meetings and in the party's press. Krensky went on to contend that by organizing an uprising, the Bolsheviks were assisting not the German proletariat, but the German ruling classes. They are opening Russia's front to the mailed fist of Wilhelm and his friends. In full awareness of my responsibility, I, procl I proclaim um, from this platform that such actions by a Russian political party constitute treason and a betrayal of the Russian state. A certain portion of the Petersburg population is in a state of insurrection. Arrests have been ordered. At the present time, when the state is imperiled by deliberate or unwitting betrayal and is at the brink of ruin, the provisional government, myself included, prefers to be killed and destroyed rather than to betray the life, honor, and the independence of the state. At this, members of the pre-parliament, with the exception of the Menshevik internationalists and left SRs, rose from their seats and gave Kerensky a prolonged resounding ovation, a circumstance which prompted a cadet, Mo Moise Adzimov, to rush to the left benches, screaming, let's have a photograph of the people sitting down. After order was restored with some difficulty, Kerensky continued his speech, reading from the Military Revolutionary Committee's Directive Number 1, which was then circulating throughout the city. He bellowed. This is an attempt to incite the rabble against the existing order. It is an attempt to block the constituent assembly and to expose the front to the serried ranks of Wilhelm's concentrated forces. Turning to the left, he insisted that at the present time, everyone must decide whether he is on the side of the Republic, freedom and democracy, or against these. In conclusion, he roundly declared, I have come to call upon you for vigilance, for the defense of the gains of freedom won by the many sacrifices, by the blood and the lives of many generations of free Russian people, all elements of Russian society. Those groups and those parties which have dared to raise a hand against the free will of the Russian people, threatening at the same time to expose the front to Germany, are subject to immediate, decisive and total liquidation. I demand that this very day the provisional government receive your answer as to whether or not it can fulfill its duty with the assurance of support from this exalted gathering. 
Kransky subsequently remembered that he left the Marinsky Palace after his speech at around 2.30 p.m., convinced that within a couple of hours he would receive a strong pledge of support from the pre-parliament. This was not to be. Pre-parliament deputies spent the rest of the afternoon and early evening at October or of October 24th in acrimonious fractional meetings, debating how best to respond to Kerensky's request for a vote of confidence. When the deputies reassembled at 7 p.m., the opposition of a significant portion of the pre-parliament to granting Kerensky carte blanche for a wholesale crackdown on the left emerged sharply. The initial speaker after the extended break was Cam Gov, chief spokesman of the left SRs. Four weeks later, in his speech to the first left SR Congress, he would recall his anguish when Kerensky demanded full powers to suppress the Bolshevik uprising and was completely oblivious to the fact that there was nobody to put down the uprising, regardless of what sanctions he was granted. Kamkov explained then that to those of us working among the lower classes of Petrograd, it was clear that in the Peter er, Petrograd garrison, Kransky would not find a dozen people who had come out to defend him as head of the coalition government. In the pre-parliament on the evening of October 24th, Kamkov declared, After... The head of the government comes here and announces that some kind of rabble is rising and demands that this assembly aid him in dealing with it. Overwhelming numbers of you may decide to grant the sanction. But I am uncertain that the Russian people, the revolutionary army, the proletariat and the laboring peasantry will do the same. Let's not play hide and seek with each other. Is there anybody at all who would trust, who would trust this government? It does not have the support of the revolutionary army or the proletariat and coming out against it is not the rabble but precisely the most politically conscious elements of the revolutionary democracy if we are seriously seriously interested in eliminating the soil in which the horrors of civil war are maturing we must openly declare that the only way out of the present predicament is through the creation of a homogeneous revolutionary democratic government in which there will be no elements who organize demonstrations of homage to Kornilov. Martov, who took the floor next on behalf of the Menshevik internationalists, was similarly critical of the existing government. As he appeared on the rostrum, someone on the right cried out, Here is the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the future cabinet, to which Martov, peering in the direction of his critic, at once retorted, I'm nearsighted and cannot tell if this is said by the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Kornilov's cabinet, declared Martov. The language of the Prime Minister who permitted himself to speak of a portion of the proletariat and the army, even if directed toward mistaken objectives, is a provocation for civil war. But I have not lost the hope that we will not yield to the desires of those who seek to use the current situation to bring the revolution to a halt. The democracy must declare that it will not give the government any support if it does not immediately guarantee that it will fulfill the most urgent needs of the people. Repression cannot be substituted for satisfaction of the needs of the revolution. An announcement must be made immediately that Russia is pursuing a policy of immediate peace, that land committees will have control over alienated lands awaiting settlement, and that the democratization of the army will not be stopped. And if such declarations are impossible for the government in its present form, then the government must be reorganized. There was nothing unexpected about these declarations by Kamkov and Martov. What was genuinely starting, st fuck, startling was the response to Kerensky's demands by representatives of the main body of Mensheviks and SRs. People like Dan and Gotts, who had openly wavered in their support for coalition for the first time in the wake of the Kornilov affair. At the pre-parliament session on the evening of October 24th, their point of view was, vo was voiced by Dan. From the outset, Dan expressed total opposition and aversion to the behavior of the Bolsheviks. Yet with equal emphasis, he insisted that if the conflict between the government and the left 
were not settled peacefully, the ultimate winners would be the extreme right. Moreover, he declared that the only way a disastrous bl bloodbath could be avoided was by responding without further delay to the aspirations of the masses who now followed the Bolsheviks. As Dan put it, Regardless of how the Bolshevik uprising ends tomorrow, if it is submerged in blood and order is restored by force of arms, practically speaking, this will be a triumph for that third force, which will sweep away the Bolsheviks, the government, the democracy, and the revolution. If you want to remove the soil in which the Bolsheviks are growing like rotten mushrooms, we must turn to political measures. What is necessary is the clear enunciation by the government and the Council of the Republic of a platform in which the people will see their just interests supported by the government and the Council of the Republic and not the Bolsheviks. The questions of peace and land and the democratization of the army must be framed in, such, framed in such a way that not a single worker or soldier will have the slightest doubt that our government is moving along this course with firm and resolute steps. In a memoir, Dan later recalled his reactions to Kerensky's speech and attempted to explain his thinking at the time. From the very beginning of the pre-parliament's deliberations in early October, he and other Menshevik and SR leaders with similar views had worked for the eventual creation of a leftist, democratic, exclusively socialist government capable of quickly en enacting a radical reform program. They had done this, Dan contended, in the belief that only through immediate drastic political steps was there any hope of successfully combating the Bolsheviks. Dan maintained that in his wing of the pre-parliament, it was axiomatic that to fight the Bolsheviks with strictly military means was useless, if only because the government did not possess such means. Dan indicated that this view was rejected by the pre-parliament right, who erroneously believed that the military force at the government's disposal was sufficient to crush the Bolsheviks, and who consequently looked forward to engaging them in open battle. After Kerensky's speech to the pre-parliament on the afternoon of October 24th, Dan and his colleagues considered it their duty to indicate to the government the only course they believed held out any hope of salvation and to re-emphasize that they were prepared to join the government in that course to the very end. Toward the close of the pre-parliament session on October 24th, three resolutions were introduced, one on behalf of cooperative organizations and the cadet party pledged full, su full support, full support <clears throat> to the government in the adoption of decisive steps to suppress the revolt in the capital. The second, a much more inflammatory resolution put forward by the command of the Cossacks, bitterly criticized the entire left, directly repudiated the provisional government for its weakness, and even for conniving with the Bolsheviks, and demanded that the government guarantee that on this occasion it would in no way indulge the Bolsheviks. The third resolution drawn up by the pre-parliament left and presented by Dan explicitly criticized the provisional government for delays in the promulgation of urgent political and social reform and made the pre-parliament's support dependent upon the immediate promulgation of a radical land and peace program and the creation of a committee of public safety made up of representatives of municipal governments and the Soviets to work with the provisional government in restoring order. At 8.30 p.m., by the narrow margin of 123 votes to 102, with 26 abstentions, the resolution of the left, in effect a vote of no confidence in Kerensky, was adopted. Dan indicated in his memoir that, upon the passage of this resolution, he and Gotts, dragging along the much more conservative president of the pre-parliament, Av. <laughs> hastened to a meeting of the cabinet in the Winter Palace to demand that the government adopt the pre-parliament's recommendations. According to Dan, he and Gotts fervently or hoped 
that the government would acquiesce and that a momentous proclamation would be printed and plastered throughout the capital that very evening, announcing to the citizenry that the provisional government had pro had formally proposed the immediate cessation of all military activity and the start of negotiations for universal peace, that land committees had been informed by phone that all manorial land holdings would be transferred to them, and that the convocation of the Constituent Assembly would be speeded up. Dan and Gotts apparently insisted to Kerensky that such action would bring about a shift in the mood of the masses and strengthen the hand of Bolshevik leaders opposed to an uprising. Not surprisingly, however, word of the pre-parliament's action drove the prime minister into a blind rage. Kransky appeared then, Dan later wrote, like a person approaching the last stages of exhaustion. At first, he declared his intention of resigning the next morning. In the end, he simply dismissed Dan Gotts and Avksentiv with the assertion that the government had no need for admonitions and instructions and would cope with the rebellion by itself. This was a great blow to those who, like Dan, hoped to neutralize popular unrest and pull the rug from under the Bolsheviks by pressuring Kerensky to adopt a more radical reform program, or failing this by forcing him to give way to a new, more responsive government. Still, efforts to achieve this goal were not halted. At an emergency joint meeting of the All-Russian Executive Committees, which began just after midnight and lasted until 4 a.m., October 25th, centrist and left Mensheviks secured passage of a resolution which, while condemning the Bolsheviks and endorsing the creation of a committee of public safety, nonetheless reaffirmed the categorical demands for immediate reform adopted earlier by the pre-parliament. Moreover, in a series of heated party strategy caucuses, the left SRs and Menshevik internationalists now campaigned vigorously for the creation by the Congress of Soviets of an exclusively socialist coalition government. This campaign initially appeared to be bearing fruit. A meeting of the Menshevik Congress fraction, which included both defensists and internationalists, adopted a set of theses for incorporation in a political resolution to be presented to the Congress, which constituted an even more significant departure from previous moderate socialist policies than did the resolution of the pre-parliament. These theses called for the complete reconstruction of the cabinet and specifically stipulated that the new government be homogeneous and democratic. While condemning the actions of the Bolsheviks, they called at the same time for the repudiation of the provisional government's policies, which were viewed as having provoked the Bolshevik insurrection. The theses also included a recommendation that attempts by the government to suppress the Bolshevik insurrection by armed force be given a firm rebuff. Meanwhile, the left SRs turned out to have a comfortable majority at a caucus of the SR Congress fraction on the morning of October 25th. A resolution offered there by the SR Central Committee was defeated by a vote of 92 to 60, after which the majority agreed to get in touch with the Menshevik internationalists evidently to coordinate efforts for the creation of a homogeneous socialist government. Equally significant in the wake of this victory, some left SR leaders retained hope that at the Congress the entire fraction might stick together behind the program of the left. To anyone analyzing political developments in Petrograd during the afternoon and early evening of October 24th, the confidence voiced by Kerensky in his ability to deal independently with the left at this time seems utterly incomprehensible. The sketchy, sometimes confused eyewitness reports that filled the latest news columns of Petrograd's newspapers on October 25th to 26th testified to the degree to which the government's position had deteriorated. Not long after Kerensky's unfortunate appearance before the pre-parliament, the anxiety of military officials at General Staff Headquarters was heightened 
by reports of alarming numbers of armed workers and soldiers congregating around Smolny. Consequently, they now issued order for the Litany, Troitsky, and Nikolevsky bridges across the new or across the Neva to be drawn, and for strict government control of the only other Neva span, the Palace Bridge. This to interdict the flow of insurgents from working class districts on the Neva's right bank to the center sections of the city. Describing his reaction upon learning of the government's intentions in regard to the Neva bridges on October 24th, the Bolshevik military organization leader Ilin, Zenev Fuck. Ilin Zenevsky subsequently wrote, Involuntarily, I remembered the July days. The drawing of the bridges appeared to me as the first step in another attempt to destroy us. Was it possible the provisional government would triumph over us again, or once again? On this occasion, there was no such danger. As soon as loyalist cadets from the Mikulovsky Artillery School arrived at the Litany Bridge, they were challenged by an irate, an irate crowd of citizens, many of them carrying weapons. Forced to give up the, their arms, the cadets were escorted humiliatingly back to their academy. As nearly as can be determined, this action took place without any specific directives from the Military Revolutionary Committee. Similarly, as soon as the struggle for the bridges began, Ilan Zanevsky, also acting on his own, saw to it that garrison soldiers took control of the smaller Grenadersky and Samsonevsky bridges across the Bolshea Nevka between the Vyberg district and the Petrograd side. The military district command gave a company of the 1st Petrograd Women's Shock Battalion responsibility for drawing the Troitsky Bridge. Orders issued to the battalion specifically authorized the use of firearms to prevent movement on the bridge. It appears that the women soldiers did not try seriously to execute this order, quite, li quite likely because machine guns mounted along the walls of the Peter and Paul Fortress were well within shooting range. After a brief struggle between cadets and Red Guards, the former were successful in drawing the Nikolevsky Bridge connecting Veselovsky Island with the center of the capital. For some time yet, the Palace Bridge remained firmly controlled by cadets and personnel of the Women's Battalion. Still, by early evening, it was apparent that the crucial battle for the bridges had been won by forces hostile to the government. Two of the four main Neva bridges were in their hands, as well as all the bridges over the Bolshea Nevka and Malaya Neva. At 4 p.m., the cyclists who had had primary responsibility for security around the Winter Palace from the time of their transfer to the capital following the July days suddenly announced that they would no longer remain at their posts. An hour later, upon orders from the Military Revolutionary Committee, one of its commissars, Stanislav Pestkovsky took control of the Central Telegraph Office. This first success in the contest for key communications facilities was obtained without a shot fired. This despite the fact that among the Telegraph Office's 3,000 employees there were not a single Bolshevik. The important factor here was a detachment of soldiers from the Kegskolmsky Regiment, which had long since pledged loyalty to the Military Revolutionary Committee. And with the support of their commander, Peskovsky pressured the head of the Postal Telegraph Workers' Union, a right SR, to recognize his authority. A detachment of cadets tried unsuccessfully to recapture the Central Telegraph Office around 8 p.m. Not long afterward, another Military Revolutionary Committee Commissar the Helsingfors Bolshevik Leonid Stark, accompanied only by 12 armed sailors, occupied and assumed supervision of the Petrograd Telegraph Agency, a newswire service. One of Stark's first acts was to stop the political resolution just then passed by the pre-parliament from going out over the wire. At about the same time, troops of the Izmilovsky Guards Regiment, the first major garrison unit to come to the government's aid in July to control the Baltic Station, 
rail terminus for loyalist reinforcements arriving from the seaboard along the Gulf of Finland and points west. The Petrograd military district headquarters could muster by way of a response was a telegraphed warning that echelons loyal to the government and the Central Executive Committee are in transit from the front. Some of the ultimately most important steps taken by the left at this time were accomplished in secret and hence for the time being were not publicly evident. In the early evening of October 24th, Debenko and Helsingfors finally re received the telegram agreed upon with Antonov during the Northern Congress of Soviets. Send the regulations, meaning dispatch sailors, sailors and ships to Petrograd. Antonov also passed a handwritten request to a liaison man from the Kronstadt Soviet, the Bolshevik Alexei Pronin, for the dispatch of Kronstadt sailors to the capital the next day. Several hours later, on behalf of the Military Revolutionary Committee, Alexei, Alexei Baronov called Debenko from Petrograd to confirm the dispatch of naval forces. The atmosphere, the atmosphere is tense, Baranov reported. Can we count on your support? The cruisers will sail at dawn, responded Dibenko. Except for the individual garrison units and Red Guard con contingents ordered by the Military Revolutionary Committee to carry out specific military tasks, most of the Petrograd area's well over half a million workers, soldiers and sailors remained in their factories and barracks, during these initial skirmishes with government forces. Throughout the afternoon and evening of October 24th, and so into the following day, a round of meetings was held in working class districts of the capital and at the main bases of the Baltic fleet. Almost invariably, these gatherings produced expression of support for the Petrograd Soviet and its program. For the first time, there were almost no popular disturbances. Mass demonstrations like those of February and July, which it was commonly assumed would signal a, a final clash between the left and the government, were completely absent. Toward mid-afternoon, when word of the drawing of the Neva Bridges began or became known, students at primary and secondary schools and employees in government offices were dismissed for the day. Banks and stores in the central sections of the city were closed and streetcar services was curtailed. Still, the streets remained calm. In the evening, fashionably dressed crowds promenaded on Nevsky Prospect, where the usual prostitutes continued to ply their trade. Restaurants, casinos, moving picture houses, and theaters operated normally, although with decreased attendance. A revival by Mayor, Mayor Hold of Alexei Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan the Terrible at the Alexandrinsky Theater and a performance of Boris Godunov at the Marinsky Theater went on as scheduled. This state of affairs, coupled with the Military Revolutionary Committee's continuing disavowal of insurrection, was profoundly confusing to contemporary observers, giving an intense sense of unreality to the decisive developments then taking place in widely scattered sections of the capital. Not surprisingly, no one appears to have been more confused and troubled by the tactics of the Military Revolutionary Committee than Lenin. Throughout this historically momentous time, he had remained away from the scene of battle at Fafanova's apartment on the outskirts of the capital. On October 20th, evidently responding to rumors of Lenin's presence in Petrograd, the Minister of Justice had issued a new order for the Bolshevik leader's arrest, dispelling any hope that it might now be safe for him to, leader, to come out of hiding. Between October 21st and 23rd, Lenin had rejoiced in the, in the Military Revolutionary Committee's successes in the struggle with the, with the Petrograd military district for control of the Petrograd garrison. But unlike Trotsky, he viewed these triumphs not as part of a gradual subversion of the provisional government's authority, which, if all went well, might culminate in a relatively painless transfer of power to the Soviets at the Congress of Soviets, but merely as the prelude to a popular armed uprising. 
and each passing day simply confirmed his long-held conviction that the prospects for creating a Bolshevik-dominated government would be maximized if power were seized by force at once. Waiting for the Congress, he felt, would simply allow the government more time to ready its forces. It would needlessly risk the creation by an indecisive Congress of, at best, a wishy-washy all-socialist coalition government. After learning of the last-minute cancellation of the Cossack procession on either October 22nd or 23rd, Lenin wrote to Sverdlov, The calling off of the Cossack demonstration is a gigantic triumph. Hurrah! Take to the attack with all forces and complete victory will be ours in a few days. In the morning papers on October 24th, Lenin read of the Military Revolutionary Committee's decisive act or decision to accept the compromise offered. Throughout the day, no doubt mostly through Fofanova, he had maintained contact with Smolny. Smolny. Thus he had learned almost at once of the government's crackdown on the left and of the efforts by some moderate socialists to force the government to adopt and immediately announce a more radical reform program. News of these developments greatly upset him. Fofanova recalled that he sent her out several times during the day and evening with requests to the Central Committee for permission to go to Smolny. Each of these appeals was summarily, sum, summarily rejected. Towards late afternoon, upon reading yet another of the Central Committee's non-committal responses, Lenin crumbled the note and threw it on the floor. I don't understand them. What are they afraid of? He stormed. Only the day before yesterday, Podvoisky reported that this military unit was Bolshevik and this other one as well. And now, and now suddenly nothing is happening. Just ask them if they have 100 loyal soldiers of Red Guardsmen with rifles. I don't need anything else. Around 6 p.m., Lenin resolved once again to circumvent the Central Committee and to call on lower levels of the party, particularly the Petersburg Committee and the District Bolshevik Committees, to take the completion of the revolution into their own hands. Quickly drafting the following appeal, he commissioned Fofanova, to deliver it to Krupskaya and no one else. Comrades, I am writing these lines on the evening of the 24th. The situation is critical in the extreme. In fact, it is now absolutely clear that to, that to delay the uprising would be fatal. With all my might, I urge comrades to realize that everything now hangs by a thread, that we are confronted by problems which are not to be solved by conferences or congresses, even congresses of Soviets, but exclusively by peoples, by the masses, by the struggle of the armed people. The bourgeois onslaught of the Kornilovites and the removal of Verkovsky show that we must not wait. We must at all costs, this very evening, this very night, arrest the government, having first disarmed the officer cadets, defeating them if they resist, and so on. We must not wait. We may lose everything. We must take power. Who must take power? That is not important at present. Let the Military Revolutionary Committee do it, some other or some other institution. All districts, all regiments, all forces must be mobilized at once and must immediately send delegations to the Military Revolutionary Committee and to the Bolshevik Central Committee with the insistent demand that under no circumstance should power be left in the hands of Kerensky and company until the 25th. Not under any circumstances. The matter must be decided without fail this very evening or this very night. History will not forgive revolutionaries for procrastinating when they could be victorious today, and they certainly will be victorious today, while they risk losing much tomorrow. In fact, they risk losing everything. If we seize power today, we seize it not in opposition to the Soviets, but on their behalf. The seizure of power is the task of the uprising. Its political purpose will become clear after the seizure. It would be a disaster or a sheer formality to await the wavering voice of October 25th. The people have the right and are in duty bound to decide such questions not by a vote, but by force. 
In critical moments of revolution, the people have the right and are in duty bound to give directions to their representatives, even their best representatives, and not to wait for them. The government is tottering. It must be given the death blow at all costs. To delay action is fatal. A few hours after sending Fafanova out with this last appeal, Lenin was unable to restrain himself further. Leaving a note for his hostess on the kitchen table, I have gone where you did not want me to go. Lenin donned his wig and a battered cap and wrapped a bandage around his face. Then, violating a direct Central Committee ban on his movement for the second time in a month, accompanied by Eno Rakia, he set off for Smolny. The two traveled through the Vyberg district as far as the Finland station in an almost empty streetcar. The frantic Lenin peppering the conductress with questions regarding late political developments. When Lenin discovered she was a leftist, he began filling her ears with practical advice on revolutionary action. As they approached Smolny on foot via Spalernea Street, where the unlucky Voinov had come to his end on July 6th, the pair was forced to dodge a roving mounted cadet patrol, scaring Rakia half out of his wits. Finally, sometime before midnight, they safely reached their destination. <clears throat> um, that's something stupid again. Small knee upon Lenin's arrival looked like a military camp on the eve of battle. Heavily armed patrols stood watch at adjacent street corners. Groups of soldiers and red guards huddled around glowing bonfires in the surrounding squares and side alleys. The courtyard inside the main gate reverberated with the din of trucks, automobiles, and motorcycles, constantly arriving and departing. And Smolny's massive facade was ablaze with light. Machine guns had been in place at both sides of the central entry. Here, guards tried to control movement into the building, which John Reed likened to a gigantic hive. Neither Rakia nor Lenin had proper passes. Initially denied admission, they managed to lose themselves in an incoming crowd and so were able to squeeze by the guards. Accidentally doffing his toupee along with his cap in the excitement, Lenin at once began upbraiding his closest associates, pressing them to get on with the business of finishing off the provisional government. Accounts of the October Revolution by writers in the Soviet Union seeking to maximize Lenin's role in the Bolshevik seizure of power at, at the expense of Trotsky's conveyed the impression that under the latter's influence, the party exaggerated Kerensky's strength and underestimated that of the left and passively awaited a vote of the Congress of Soviets to create a revolutionary government. This interpretation is, of course, seriously distorted, as we have seen the policies of the Military Revolutionary Committee between October 21st and 24th were directed toward effectively subverting the provisional government in advance of the Congress, an objective already largely fulfilled by the night of October 24th. Also, these tactics were, dis were dictated more than anything else by what seems to have been a realistic evaluation of the prevailing correlation of forces and popular mood. Yet there is a measure of truth in the Soviet view that prior to Lenin's appearance at Smolny, late on the night of October 24th to 25th, a majority of the Military Revolutionary Committee, not to speak of the Central Committee, was still uneasy about the possibility of going too far too fast, of losing potentially crucial support, or perhaps even breaking up the Congress by appearing to usurp the functions of the Congress of Soviets. As we have seen the Military Revolutionary Committee's initial efforts in the wake of the government's offensive against the left were aimed at alerting left forces and readying them for possible action, not calling the masses into the streets. And almost all of the Military Revolutionary Committee's subsequent military operations on October 24th can be interpreted as reactions to offensive moves by the government. Thus, garrison soldiers were sent to reopen Rabachi Put after the government had closed it, and military revolutionary committee forces took control of the Neva bridges when the government set about interrupting movement over them. 
Similarly, forces supporting the Military Revolutionary Committee reopened the Baltic station following reports that troops loyal to the government from Peterhof and the Northern Front were boarding trains bound for the capital. It is altogether likely that as Kerensky's helplessness in the prevailing situation became more obvious, and as the hour of the Congress's opening drew near, the pace of the Military Revolutionary Committee's operations would have quickened, whether or not Lenin appeared on the scene. But it must also be borne in mind that Lenin, in contrast to almost everyone else, attached decisive importance to overthrowing the provisional government in advance of the, pro of the Congress. His arrival at Smolny inevitably intensified pressure on the leadership of the left to act more boldly. At any rate, for whatever the reason, well before dawn on October 25th, the actions of the Military Revolutionary Committee suddenly became much more aggressive. All pretense that the committee was simply defending the revolution and attempting most of all to maintain the status quo pending the expression of the Congress's will was abruptly dropped. Instead, an open all-out effort was launched to confront Congress delegates with the overthrow of the provisional government prior to the start of their deliberations. There is very little hard evidence regarding the, circumstance of the circumstances of this decision. Latsis leader wrote that towards morning on the famous night when the question of a government was being decided and the Central Committee wavered, Illich ran to the office of the Petersburg Committee with the question, Fellows, do you have shovels? Will the workers of Piter go into the trenches at our call? Latsis recorded that the response was positive, adding that the decisiveness of Lenin and the Petersburg Committee affected the waverers, allowing Lenin to have his way. From the subsequent complaints of top left, uh, left, uh, top left SR leaders, it appears clear that the Military Revolutionary Committee shifted its stance without their knowledge. In any case, the moment when this fundamental tactical change occurred can be pinpointed fairly closely. Thus, on the evening of October 24th, Oswald Zenis, Military Revolutionary Committee Commissar in the Pavlovsky Regiment, was ordered to take control of the Troitsky Bridge between the Petersburg side and the War Memorial Field. He recalls that around 9 p.m. after taking the bridge, he detected a sharp increase in traffic to and from the Palace Square. On his own, he directed the erection of barricades, the establishment of checkpoints to and from the Winter Palace, and the arrest of government officials, the most important of whom were escorted to Smolny. A short time after initiating these measures, Zenis received an urgent call from Podvoisky, informing him that the arrested officials sent to Smolny by him were being released, that the kind of action he had undertaken was unauthorized and premature, and that while the Military Revolutionary Committee had not yet decided when more active operations would be initiated, it would not be before the next day. But Voisky insisted that Zenis stop detaining government officials and dismantle his checkpoints, an order which Zenis asserts appeared so short-sighted that he did not implement it. A few hours later, evidently around 2 a.m., Zenis received a new order. This time he was directed to reinforce his cordon of outposts and to strictly control all movement through it. About this time, that is 2 a.m. October 25th, the first company of the 6th Engineer Battalion occupied the Nikolaevsky Station off Znamensky Square, then dominated by a massive bronze equestrian statue of Alexander III. One of the engineers later recalled the moment. It was a freezing night. One could feel the north wind penetrate or permeate the bones. On the streets adjacent to the Nikolaevsky Station, groups of engineers huddled, shivering from the cold, and peered vigilantly into the shadowy night. The moonlight created a fantastic scene. The hulks of houses looked like medieval castles. Giant shadows followed the engineers. At this sight, the next to the last emperor appeared to reign in his horse in horror. Also around 2 a.m., a military revolutionary committee commissar, Mikhail Fehrman, 
to control the pet of the Petrograd Electric Station. At his direction, electrical services to most government buildings was switched off. More or less simultaneously, insurgent soldiers occupied the main post office where the Military Revolutionary Committee Commissar Karl Kudlupski took charge. Sometime after midnight, the crew of the Aurora had been authorized to use all means at its disposal to restore traffic along the Nikolaevsky Bridge because the ship's captain at first refused to have anything to do with this order. The Military Revolutionary Committee Commissar Alexander Bel Belashev and several sailors took over operation of the vessel themselves. Navigating the Aurora through the shallow, twisting Neva was a tricky business, however, and the captain soon gave in. Announcing that he could not allow the Aurora to be run aground, he agreed to help bring the newly renovated ship to its destination. At 3.30 a.m., the Aurora moved to an anchorage next to the Nikolaevsky Bridge, the one Neva Bridge still under government control. As the Aurora's crew directed its searchlights on the bridge, the cadets responsible for guarding it fled into the night. Ship's electricians supervised the closing of the span. A short time later, when a 32-man detachment of government shock troops sent to reopen the bridge arrived on the scene, they found it securely in the hands of some 200 workers and sailors. A 40-man detachment of sailors occupied the state bank at 6 a.m. There was no resistance. A soldiers of the Semenovsky regime or regiment on regular guard there remained neutral. An hour later, a detachment of soldiers from the Kegols, the Kegskomsky regiment, accompanied by Lashevich and another military revolutionary committee commissar. P.S. Kalyagin occupied the main Petrograd telephone station, immediately shutting off most lines to military headquarters in the Winter Palace. Bloodshed during occupation of the telephone station was avoided, in part perhaps because the detachment of Kekskolomsky soldiers was commanded by one A. Zak Zakharov, who as a military school cadet had often served on guard duty there. Familiar with security procedures at the telephone station, he supervised the quick isolation and disarmament of the cadets on guard. Thus, by early morning, October 25th, the government was for the most part without phones or lights. At 8 a.m., the last of Petrograd's three major rail terminals, the Warsaw Station, terminal point for rail lines connecting the, the capital with the Northern Front and Army Headquarters at Peskov, also fell to the Military Revolutionary Committee. In the Winter Palace, a closed meeting of the cabinet devoted to consideration of further measures to deal with the left had broken up at 1 a.m. At 3 a.m., Kerensky received further alarming reports on the developing situation. Accompanied by the Deputy Premier Konovalov, he again hurried off the General Staff building. The reports he received there throughout the remainder of the night and early morning were uniformly bleak. One key point after another was passing rapidly into the Military Revolutionary Committee's hands. The military school cadets and soldiers of the Women's Battalion, the main forces in the Winter Palace, were now becoming understandably fidgety. Suddenly announcing their inability to fight soldiers of the garrison, they were temporarily calmed by what were, in retrospect, misleading assurances that troops from the front were expected momentarily. At Kerensky's command, towards dawn, a last desperate appeal was directed to Cossack forces in the capital. In the name of freedom, honor, and the glory of our native land, the commander-in-chief has ordered the 1st, 4th, and 14th Cossack regiments to act to aid the Soviet Central Executive Committee, the revolutionary democracy, and the provisional government, and to save the perishing Russian state. In reply, Cossack spokesmen asked whether the infantry would also be coming out. Receiving an unsatisfactory response, representatives of all but a relatively small number of Cossacks let it be known they had no intention of acting alone and serving as live targets. 
The text of a candid report from General B.A. Levitsky in Petrograd to General Mikhail Deterix at the front about developments in Petrograd on October 24th captures the prevailing situation. Levitsky brought Deterix up to date on the struggle for control of the garrison between the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Petrograd Military District Headquarters and on the former's directive calling on garrison units not to obey the orders of the latter. Levitsky observed, This act yesterday forced the Minister-President to explain clearly and precisely to the Council of the Republic, the pre-Parliament, the situation which had developed and to indicate the actions to be taken by the Provisional Government. After this, units of the Petrograd garrison went over to the side of the Bolsheviks. The bridges which had been drawn open were once again closed. The entire city is covered by posts manned by garrison soldiers, but there has not been a mass coming out. The telephone station is in the garrison's hands. Those units in the Winter Palace are guarding it only in a strictly formal sense, since they have already agreed not to actively come out. It is as if the provisional government were in the capital of an enemy country. By the morning, by the morning of October 25th, the government's desperate situation had finally become obvious, even to the hitherto obtusely confident commander of the Petrograd Military District, General Polkovnik Polkovnikov. He now drafted a report to Kransky in which he evaluated the situation as critical and concluded that for practical purposes, the government had no troops at its disposal. At this juncture, Kransky's sole hope for survival appeared to rest with the successful mobilization of solid support from the army at the front. In view of this, at about 9 a.m., Kransky left Konovalov in temporary charge of the cabinet and began to make arrangements for an immediate departure to Peskov. A few hours earlier, the Bolshevik Central Committee had met at Smolny. It appears that no protocol of this historically important assembly was ever recorded. At any rate, none has been published, and the existing bits and pieces of information about what took place there come from a few sketchy memoirs. The scene of the gathering was apparently the Central Committee's regular meeting place, room 36 on the first floor. Lenin was there, and also, among others, Trotsky, Stalin, Smilga, Militin, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Berzin. Rikia tucked himself into a corner to wait for Lenin and to watch the proceedings. From time to time, someone knocked at the door with reports on the course of the struggle for power in the streets outside. Lenin expressed satisfaction at each advance, at the same time pressing impatiently for the seizure of the Winter Palace and the arrest of the provisional government. During a brief break in the deliberations, one of the Central Committee members suggested drawing up a list of the government to be submitted to the Congress the next day. And immediately, there arose the question of what to call the new government and its members. One memoirist recalls that to everyone the term provisional government sounded outmoded and that the term ministers for members of the government conveyed an unacceptable sense of bureaucratic mustiness. It was Trotsky who quickly came forth with the idea of calling the new ministers people's commissars, a suggestion which delighted all those present. Yes, that's very good. Lenin interjected, it smells of revolution, and we can call the government itself the Council of People's Commissars. Seizing pencil and paper, <laughs> Militin prepared to accept suggestions for commissars. Still, the battle against the provisional government had not yet ended, and to some Central Committee members, drawing up a list of cabinet members seemed so premature that they treated it, at first, as a joke.